Hello and welcome to the city of Puebla, a couple of hours east of Mexico City, the capital of this wonderful country. And this is round eight of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship, the CBMM Neobium Puebla E3. My name is Jack Nichols and we have a very, very interesting second free practice session coming up for you in a couple of minutes time. We had uh, the first session earlier on, which happened just as the sun was rising over this beautiful part of the world. The two Jaguar racing drivers arriving, Nick Cassidy and uh, Robin Freitz for the Envision Virgin Racing team. Robin Freitz there, the championship leader. Oliver Rowland looking for a strong result this weekend. Pascal Verlein and the Porsche squad. And Tom Blomquist looking to get off the bottom of the championship standings as Max Gunter warmed himself up. And it is getting a little bit warmer. Fairly pleasant weather at the moment. And uh, Robin Freitz is fairly pleasantly sitting at the top of the championship. Five points clear of Nick de Vries, but it's very, very tight, isn't it? Between the top seven, really. Rask, Roland, Dennis, a little adrift maybe. But the top seven, certainly you wouldn't put it past any of those to wrap up the championship come the end of the season in Berlin. Further down the order, some big names like Max Gunter, like Lucas de Grassi, like Sebastian Buemi, all who have had a very difficult first half of the year. But mathematically, any one of those 24 drivers could lead the championship after this weekend because there's 62, uh, sorry, 60 points available. Uh, Mercedes are at the top of the team's championship, two points clear of Jaguar Racing, and there's only seven points between the top three there. Uh, Neo 333 down at the bottom, but there's quite an interesting battle with Nissan Venturi and Dragon for those lower places. And this is the Puebla circuit. It's uh, the first time that Formula E have been here, maybe the first time you've ever seen it. And this is how it goes on the run down through the off the banked oval corner down into the 90 degree left hander at turn one. The track then swoops right through two and three before looping left through four. Turn seven here. This right hander has been one of the trickiest of the day. Attack mode activation is at turn eight back through turn nine again, off to the oval for a little moment, and then a 90 degree left to another infield section at turn 11, 12, 13, 14, and then onto the oval banking, which has been a real challenge for the drivers in the first free practice session earlier on today, which was slightly extended because Mahindra's Alexander Sims had a problem, but that is the three kilometer, 15 corner circuit. I'm joined in the commentary box on what is now beautiful weather when, when it was absolutely miserable this morning. She was in the pit lane. Now it's all sunny in the air con, Nikki Shields. And as promised, four seasons in one day. Well, I yeah. think we've definitely had two so far. Um, it's whether we get that torrential downpour later this afternoon, which we're keeping our fingers crossed that 40% chance of rain will slowly disappear to zero. But um, yeah, it's brilliant to be back here in Mexico for the sixth time, um, but obviously at a brand new racetrack in Puebla and super exciting as well, because obviously later we're going to have a limited number, but we will have some Mexican fans coming to support the drivers and the teams. And I think they are uh, you know, such passionate fans, it's always great to have them here. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, Robin Freitz, who's leading the championship. Never never scored particularly well in Mexico City has, uh, has Robin Freitz. I think he has one points finish, which was fifth back in season two when he's with Andretti in his first year in the championship. Uh, it's the only time he's ever scored points. He was 11th in season three and five and 12th in season six before being disqualified. There is the newcomer Joel Eriksson driving for the uh, Dragon team, the Swedish racer who had his first taste of Formula E race weekend earlier on today. What a tough racing weekend for him, though. Starting, I spoke to him before it was announced that the team had a 20-place grid penalty for each of the drivers because they uh, they tempered, they had a check with the inverter on the car um, and had to take the seal off, which unfortunately, even though they didn't change the inverter, unfortunately, you get a 20-place um, grid penalty for that. So really tough. First race in Formula E and knowing that you're going to be in the back of the grid. Tough as well for Alexander Sims. You just saw him there watching this session because it doesn't look like he'll be taking, well, maybe any part in it at all because I think they have to change the battery in the back of that uh, Mahindra after the mechanical problem earlier on, but they might have to change the powertrain as well. So we'll, we'll try and get to the bottom of exactly what they need to check. But in the pit lane, what, half an hour ago, Sims's car was just coming back. So a lot of work for them to do and, and a tough afternoon ahead for Alexander Sims because he only managed three laps. So the car's out on track, there it is. So yeah, it does look as though they um, have 
maybe replace the powertrain too. And a lot of work to be done on the on the back of that Mahindra. So I, and they don't look particularly rushed either. So I would suggest Sims won't be out in the next half hour. There's Lucas de Grassi, the 36-year-old Brazilian, taking the checkered flag three times in Mexico City. He disqualified from one of them, but still the most successful driver in Mexico. And he's in no rush to go out. Same as uh, Max Gunther, the 23-year-old German, waiting to head out onto the track. But a lot of the drivers straight out. It's, um, it's a tough one, isn't it, at the moment? Because Lucas Degrassi, I mean, he is a champion, season three champion, and yet he's sitting down 19th in the driver standings. The same, you mentioned Sebastian Bremi sitting down in 27th, 22nd. And we always talk about the kind of the cream rising to the top. Well, that hasn't happened so far this season. For oh, you, but well, maybe they're not the cream, Nikki. Well, we always thought they were. <laughs> and they have risen to the top in previous years. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that just shows how competitive Formula E is getting. And I know we always talk about that, but I really do think this is the season where it's got even more competitive than ever before. I think, you know, this time last year, Antonio Felix da Costa, who won the championship, had double the points that Robin Frain had, Frain, Frain has at this point in the championship. This is the lowest amount of points that the championship leader has had after round seven in the history of Formula E. So never has someone been this low. I think Jerome D'Ambrosio in season five had 65 points, but Freitz here at the top of the championship had 62. And I think when uh, Jerome had 65, I think we didn't have points for a lot of the things that we that we do now. But here comes Jean-Eric Vern in the DS to Gita, those two running. Uh, at, the, at the head of the field at the moment, coming into this left-hander of Turn 4. And massive credit to the DS to Cheetah team for getting Jean-Eric Verne's car ready this morning. I think it took them 15 minutes to change the entire rear of the car. So that's what gearbox, inverter, motor, rear suspension. Um, and uh, this is a little off record, but I'm going to say it, and Ian James is going to tell me off for saying it now. <laughs> but we did have a quick chat with him afterwards. And uh, let's just say he was quite impressed at the time that they did it. Okay, I, I okay, think Mercedes might be practising that. OK, that's all right. That wasn't He's never going to speak to me again now. No, exactly. <laughs> that's not too off the record. I thought you were going to give us the really good off the record stuff. <laughs> That'll come later. Yeah. Uh, Keep listening. Very, <laughs> very different track conditions now to earlier on. It was really damp when free practice one started so as a result it's almost this is almost the first free practice session for these drivers because i would suggest it's bone dry now as da costa comes around turn 12 the right hander then through turn 13 this big sweeping left hander for those of you who are maybe just joining us because maybe you're watching something else during free practice one uh, this is the puebla race circuit and this is the banking through the final corner for uh, antonio felix da costa where a lot of the drivers were getting a little bit loose Go on board with Costa down towards turn one. Sets a one minute 25.838. Uh, had a couple of uh, one yellow flag out there at turn one. I think someone's gone in a little bit deep at turn 11. It was uh, Oliver Rowland, the teammate of this man Sebastian Buemi, who was quickest in free practice one, but it was much damper than this. And there were still some puddles on the circuit, as I say. It's Pretty dry now. There is Roland going through in the Nissan, and he's quickest at the moment too. A, a one minute twenty-four point eight two three. Two and three. You're the best. Two hundred. Sector one. We are missing three tenths. So the cost of being told in two hundred kilowatts of of uh, power, you are quickest in sectors two and three, but we're missing three tenths in sector one. And there he is activating the attack mode right on the outside, and you're going to lose so much time activating attack mode this weekend that it's. It's, it's going to be almost impossible, I think, to activate it without coming out where you don't want to be. It's going to be absolutely fascinating to see. I think they're talking about three seconds, possibly a little bit more uh, time that it's going to cost you. Um, and it's also going to be really difficult on the exit of the activation zone because, I mean, the way the rules are, you have to really give way to the other car that's on track. However, obviously, if you're coming out of the activation zone and you've got more power, you're going to be wanting to go faster. So are we going to see drivers colliding at that point? It's um, going to be close. Driver's eye with Oliver Rowland coming through the banking. Oh, maybe just a little feather. It sounded pretty flat for OK. He's only at 200 kilowatts at the moment as he comes down in towards turn one, lifting off the throttle and then getting on the brakes. We saw uh, De Costa going straight on at turn 11 a couple of moments ago, but no real drama for the DS to Cheetah driver and the driver's getting a lot closer to the walls now that the track is drying lock up there uh, down into turn one from one of the ds to cheetahs 
I did enjoy my track walk with the uh, Venturi team yesterday and did learn the difference between the braking points between the full power quali lap into the first turn. If you're on a 250 lap, you're going to be braking at about 110 metres. But if you're on uh, in race pace, it's going to be about 80 metres. Again. Yep. It's one of the very few motorsport formula where you're braking earlier the, if you're on your flying lap because uh, usually you break as late as possible on your quickest lap, but here, because you're arriving with so much more speed, you, you have to break a little bit earlier, so those are interesting figures there. Uh, here's Nick DeVries, second place man in the championship at the moment in the Mercedes EQ team. Anything else to say off the record about Mercedes, <laughs> or are we, are we done with all the sequels? Well, I, I better save those for later, just after we've got the Mercedes interviews done for the race show. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, Nick, he has put in an absolutely phenomenal performance this season. The only driver to take home two race wins so far. Um, you know, five points in it between him and Robin Prines. And I think, you know, the Mercedes team are looking really quick here today. Debris through this long left-hander of 13 and then 14 and 15 is the banking here. Again, 200 kilowatts, so probably flat out as he dives down towards the low part and then back up towards the wall on the exit and uh, does a 1 minute 29.2 which is uh, about five seconds off the pace of Oliver Rowland so he's on a, a race run at the moment is Nick De Vries and there is Ian James on the right hand side feeling hurt and betrayed yep he is isn't he <laughs> Those eyes, oh no. <laughs> well, guys, you'll know if you never have an interview from Mercedes again, the reason why. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I think but that's what? seven seasons of Formula E. That might be my favourite ever moment. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Well, there you are. We can thank him, James, for that one. <laughs> and now I might lose my job. <laughs> but it was worth it for your favourite moment. Um, but what is interesting, actually, I've got to say, because the Mercedes team are doing really well at the moment, I think, about finding the efficiency in the car. And, you know, we talk about Formula E becoming so much more competitive. And, and I think that's because, you know, once you're at the top, once you're reaching, you know, efficiency of, say, 97%, there isn't that much further to go. You yeah. might be able to get small increments, maybe 97 and a half, 98 perhaps. But if perhaps you're a team towards the, the bottom of the grid and your efficiency was more like 90, 95, suddenly you can step up quite quickly um, to actually, you know, again, close up that gap, which I think is why we're seeing such a, such a competitive season. Well, Christian Silk, the team principal of NEO, described something similar. He said, what we have to do is get to, to get NEO back towards the front is go for the low-hanging fruit. We don't need to come up with some crazy new invention and reinvent the wheel. We've got to do the basics right and that will bring you up to a certain degree and then you get into those smaller and smaller margins and you think back to season three in Mexico City where Lucas Degrassi broke his front wing had to pit and still came through to win the race you could do that back in those days you can't these days because it's just so tight as we see uh, Edo Mortara in the Rocket Venturi coming into turn four. And I think that's why, you know, was it Lucas that went from, was it 19th on the grid to win a race? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, that, that, yeah, we don't we don't see that anymore. I mean, we've seen it a couple of times, actually, this season. Climbing maybe 10 or 12 places yeah. from towards the back but of the you're grid, not but not take a win. Yeah, exactly. As uh, Mortara comes through turn seven, they've been a little bit more behaved at turn seven so far today as uh, the Swiss racer after no points for Venturi in Monaco but Mortara has actually scored points in all of his Mexico City appearances he finished third on the podium in season five then went on to win the next race in Hong Kong but I mean Mortara you know he started out with so much promise in that first race in Diria you know being on the podium with a second place finish um, and he's had three DNF since absolutely it's been a real because the pace has been there but there have been times where he was it where one of the races he wasn't able to take qualifying was he because he was about to go out onto the track and the and the car wouldn't fire up so there's been so many mitigating circumstances but you can say that about so many people throughout the grid Mortara did do a little lift there on his 200 kilowatt lap still that Roland time from earlier on that's quickest at the moment there is uh, Jerome D'Ambrosio who did win in Mexico City that first race the Formula E here, not here, but there. It's interesting, though. You know, back to your last point. I think we always talk again in Formula E about consistency.
see, you know, consistency is really key, bringing home the points. But you look, look at Lucas Degrassi, he's always a consistent driver. He's actually managed to finish, I think, the most. He's finished five times, five races in the points, but always just a couple of points each time. So it's not enough. You've got to be consistent and at the top. Uh, hashtag Puebla Ypres, if you want to get in touch over the weekend. Cassidy, love it. Big old slide, got on the dirt, sprayed it up. Full, full rally cross style there from Cassidy. Who am I? Oh, am Say I making it. up that he? I, <laughs> no, did he start his career in dirt racing? I think Cassidy started his career in dirt racing in New Zealand. But so he's made for this track. I might be wrong. <laughs> And I've just looked at my notes, and obviously it's not in it, but here we go. So he's uh, just got a little wide. Nice. Not nice for him, but it's bringing so much dirt back onto the track as well. You can see how grubby it is on the on the racing line, which the, the drivers are struggling with. Yeah, I think it's something like one of the drivers saying it's about five centimetres into turn seven. It's like, if you miss the line by five centimetres, that's it. No grip. You're in the grass. Which just shows that, you know, just that. Okay. Such a fine... Uh, blue, 449, green, 1875. Um, Cassidy, he started his career racing midgets in New Zealand, which is like dirt ovals stuff. In the, in, uh, I'm giving, I'm giving Jack a round of applause. I don't know if you can hear that. Thank you. <laughs> well done. So, yeah, he's used to going sideways on... Well, he was when he was a child, but he's uh, he's been in formula racing, single-seaters and GTs and stuff since 2008. So, a little bit of a throwback there. And then giving some feedback on the on the radio, on the on the state of his... But, I mean, you energy. know, you, you look at what Envision Version are doing at the moment. They're, they're running the Audi powertrain, of course, um, and yet they're out-competing Audi in most races. You've got Robin at the top of the driver standings. And quite interestingly, I think, I wonder if the dynamic has changed within the team. Obviously, you've got Nick Cassidy coming in to replace Sam Bird. Sam Bird was a member of the family there. You know, he was, he, Sam Bird did every single race with Envision Virgin. But since Sam's leave left, Robin has kind of had to step up to be top dog within the team. And I wonder whether that has changed his, uh, his mindset, you know, because he is now driving at the top of the standings. There was, a, there was an article uh, about this, actually, where and, and Chris Gorn was saying how much Robin Price has changed as a driver over the last three years because he was Mr. Lazy. He's still pretty lazy, <laughs> but just a little bit less lazy. And and is actually and uh, there is Sylvain Felipe on the left hand side, Mike Lug on the uh, on the right hand side. But uh, supposedly Robin learns a lot in in DTM uh, working with Rene Rast because Rene Rast is Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Data, you know he's really keen on uh, on studying all of the data, whereas France wasn't, and they've kind of converged a little bit together, I believe. Interesting, uh, because that's massively played to Rene Rast's advantage, you know, coming into Formula E for his first full season, and uh, he's eighth in the championship. Here are the two Porsches, and they are running out there on circuit, uh, although Lotta has just backed off a little bit to go away from Verline. But again, a, a, a real sort of up and down season for, for Porsche too. Some great qualifyings for Pascal Verline. Lotta almost took the lead in Rome, but not a huge amount of points to show for it. Verline comes through turn seven. Down into eight. Again, there you can see attack mode activation at the bottom left. Activated by uh, Edo Motaro. Just a rear, just drift behind, drift behind, 235. Drift behind. So Lotter trying to give a bit of feedback and yeah, is uh, and Fabrice Roussel saying, no, no, let the guy behind go through. But um, rears drifting and drifting throughout the lap. It's something we don't get a lot in Formula E is tyre degradation. And, uh, and having to keep your tyres sort of in the perfect operating window to quite the degree that we're, that we're seeing here. Tire management is going to be a big thing for this race, isn't it? It really is where the race could be could be won or lost. Berline through the banking. Uh, De Costa, has he just turned up to full power to start a flying lap? Uh, no, he's on attack mode, actually. So he was just practicing uh, fan boost and then is running at 
attack mode at the moment. Still that Roland time from earlier on is the quickest. A 24 point, well it was until Jean-Eric Verne now goes to the top of the times on a 24.326. And a, well, presumably a setup change in here for Max Gunter taking the front wing off and then getting stuck into some of the settings down there. Now, Max Gunter's interesting because, of course, BMW are leaving at the end of this season. So he is probably fighting to keep his seat with Andretti. I know there's lots of discussions going on about driver contracts for next season um, and who's going to be jumping from which seat. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see if he can remain with Andretti. Dennis goes up into fourth place. I guess the same is true of him. But uh, BMW I Andretti, it's been a, there's been some strong performances from Dennis this year. Obviously, Valencia stands out where he won from pole position. Was looking quite good in Diria, but I think got affected by the red flag for Sergio sending cameras crashing crash qualifying right at the start of the campaign. But he was one of those rookies that basically said they were taking it too conservatively when they first started in Formula E. You think, OK, I'll just take it steady. And you take it steady and you're, and you're absolutely nowhere. Uh, Blomquist, I think, has had quite a good season. OK, not a huge amount of points. Uh, five, in fact, but qualifying him and uh, Oliver Turvey have been pretty neck and neck. I think Blomkus has been out in the later groups more often than Turvey, but he's, he's managed to keep a kind of similar pace. It's the first time for a few years that Neo have had two strong drivers, and uh, we're getting both Blomkus and Turvey's lap times here. Blomkus doing a 24.9 to go fourth quickest, and uh, his teammate we're on board with now, Oliver Turvey, coming through the final corner for the Neo 333 team. And Turvey does a 1 minute 25.1. So again, it looks as though they were both doing a, a similar run that time. And Blomquist was two seconds, uh, two tenths, sorry, quicker. But I think this will be another tough weekend for them. Although, track evolution could be quite big in qualifying, which could play into the hands of the Group 4 drivers. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how tight qualifying is. But, you know, is qualifying as important? I know it's always important, but is it as important at this track? You know, where perhaps other tracks is a bit harder to overtake. There seems to be quite a lot of overtaking opportunities. If we're seeing tyre deg degradation and tyre management being an issue, perhaps qualifying is less important? Well, <laughs> I think... Uh, I take your point. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> it's, if you're if you're second or seventh, you can maybe you can still do something. If you're starting 19th, you're done. I think that's that's the thing is that I, I do agree that your grid position doesn't define where you start. But you look at the Mercedes drivers in Monaco had a horrible time in qualifying, and suddenly they're right at the back, and and they scored no points. So. To a degree, so you, you can you get away with it. You need to be in the top ten. <laughs> you got to be you don't in the need mix. You to be on pole position. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. So, De Costa there at the top of the timings at the moment. This is interesting because is De Costa. I mean, I feel like he's kind of riding the wave at the moment. He's got this momentum going. Obviously, he had the incredible win, that phenomenal um, performance, taking the lead of the race in the last lap. And then he's also just been out racing at the uh, eight hours of Portimao in uh, the World Endurance Championship and took his first win as a home race for him, which is rather nice. I don't think he's raced much in Portugal overall because there isn't much, there isn't a huge, oh, a big lock up there from uh, whatever BMW that is coming down into turn one. I think it's Jake Dennis. Big lock up on the right front, does the little Yui and joins the track again. But yeah, obviously there's there's Estoril and Portimao in Portugal, but there's not a, a huge racing scene. So he kind of went to the rest of Europe fairly swiftly, I think, the Costa. Mitch Evans, third in the championship. Haven't seen much of him today, actually. Second on the times at the moment on a 23.8, 4,000 slower than Norman Natto, but the only driver to have finished on the podium three times this season with three third place finishes. Did really feel for Mitch Evans at the end of the Monaco race. I mean, missing out. OK, so he definitely missed out on first position, but taking the second, I think it was it two, th two hundredths of a second yeah. between him and Robin Freins. Really, really tough day for him. Especially when win winning in Monaco means so much. Well, there was the real irony that he made that amazing move up the hill 
up by Ravage. And if he had sat in the slipstream and saved energy up that hill instead of making that amazing overtake, he might have won the race. And that's the, those are the kind of percentages you're, you're talking about in Formula E. It's, it's risk versus reward, isn't it? And uh, that is James Barkley on the left, taking a risk sitting next to Adrian, but, you know, that's, that's, what, that's, what, uh, that's what goes Everyone's with, getting it today. Yeah, exactly, this is fun. Uh, we love Adrian. Who are you going to pick on next? Uh, well, nine minutes to go. There's plenty of time. The pit limiter and giving out to the speed. That's on the way in, not on the way out. Way in, just, just now. Okay, so Mitch Evans coming into the pits and saying the pit limiter didn't get him down to the right speed. Sergio said the camera is also under investigation for uh, going too quickly in the pit lane. And there is Marco Fuga, who will be joining uh, engineering Joel Eriksson for the weekend. And here's Max Gunter again coming down towards turn one. Right, he's going full power then, Max Gunter. The first of the drivers with eight and a half minutes to go to go for a push lap. I also wonder what we'll see with regards to out laps and warm up laps in this session, whether you won't want to do your prep lap because it'll take too much out of the tires. As Gunter, it is, it is a, it's a fair, it's, a, it's a not that long a lap, one minute, 23 seconds. So you've got time to do the, to do the out lap and, and the preparation lap. Oh, lock up there from Gunter coming into turn eight. It's not like Rome where it was, what, a one minute 45 or something. and. You had to get straight on it, so let's we'll see where the teams do different things. Gunter is 700s down on Nato in sector one as he comes towards turn 11. Another lockup. Gets it in, unloaded inside wheel, so not terrible, but uh, he's now, well, he's half a second down actually on Norman Nato, so this is not going well for Gunter this lap. Yellow flag out there at uh, turn five that very quickly comes in. So nothing too dramatic it seems as Gunter now comes out through the final corner. Now watch the purple on the left. If that disappears from being purple, it means he's lifted and he's had a big lift and he's had a big wobble. Goodness me. Gunter through the final corner and across the line does a, uh, goes 10th on a one minute 24.591. But that was a big moment through the banking. Seven minutes to go. So I had a chat with Lucas Degrassi about, you know, the... Oh, look at this. Here he was then. Can you was looking with that high pitch tone again? Yeah, exactly. He was looking loose all the way through and then got really loose in that mid part of the corner. Got it all straightened up again. Roger Griffiths, team principal of BMW I Andretti. What was Lucas Degrassi saying to you? Um, so despite the fact that this has probably been well, it has been the, the worst half of a season to date in his Formula E career. He was quite reflective of it, just saying, you know, that th we're doing our best. You know, I I'm not getting stressed about it. We are trying to deliver our best. Um, the car is quick. You know, they have had some, they, ha they have had the pace in the car. Um, they've just had a bit of bad luck, you know. I mean, obviously, he was going to take that win when he then got the uh, drive shaft failure. Yeah. Um, so that would have changed things, I suppose. But yeah, he just seemed, um, as always, very mature, but his feathers haven't been ruffled, and I think they're just still determined to try and deliver on that consistency and just carry on with what they're doing and not change tact. We've seen so many late surges in the history of Formula E. Bohemi mentioned this yesterday. I think Bohemi's a bit too far adrift to, to do that much of a late surge, but... Was it was it last was it, was, it, that was it last season or the, maybe it might have been the last two seasons? Buemi has just been nowhere and then ended up finishing kind of second in the standings because he's managed to find so much speed. That's Roland in the wall. He's managed to keep it driving coming out of turn 11. It doesn't look too bent. It looks as though the wall actually came off worse in that fight with Oliver Roland. And. Uh, so Sikar with some frustration, a little shake of the head. Tommaso Volpe, the global motorsport uh, boss of Nissan, is in there. But yeah, it looks as though Roland's got it. He's returning to the pits, obviously, but it looks as though he's got away with that. for the, for the the. I don't think he was on a full power lap, Roland. Uh, Van Dorn is on one now, but uh, he also... Uh, it was Check the front wing. Check the front wing, says Roland. He was also the cause of that very brief yellow flag at turn five, Oliver Roland. So 
Here's Stoffel van Dorn through the middle sector. He's three tenths up on Norman Natto. He's at full power, qualifying mode. Sixth place man in the championship. Let's see what again. Keep your eyes on that pink bottom left. If it dips away from being pink, then he's lifted. And he has lifted, and he's out of shape as well. And you can hear it rattling while he's offline. And Van Dorn across the line goes quickest on a 23.586. But I tell you, that last corner's a lot of fun. Here's a look at Roland again coming into turn 11. So he locked up, missed the apex. And then, OK, so he's just OK, he's chunked the tech pro, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't a huge... If that, if that had been a concrete wall, I think he's in a lot more trouble. Okay, on board driver's eye. Made a bit of a mess of it, but... Jake Dennis, full power. Three and a half minutes to go. Coming down towards turn 11. So are we, are we going to see another flash of, uh, you know, amazing performance from Jake Dennis again? Having that win, I mean, a, a rookie taking a win in Valencia was really quite impressive. Yeah, it was strong. Never quite got up to speed in Monaco. It was first time racing there, and so he never quite hooked up with the, with the place. But this is a new circuit for everyone, which I think will be a you would have thought would be a benefit for the rookies. Dennis lifts off and actually is very neat and tidy through that final uh, left-hander. Dennis goes quickest. A 1 minute 23.544, 400 is quicker than Van Dorn and unsurprisingly, the fastest final sector of anyone because it was pretty neat and tidy. Roland going straight back out in the Nissan. He's got a new helmet this weekend, Oliver Roland. Similar design, but a, but a new lid. And this is Nick De Vries, who's second in the championship at the moment. Evans is on a quick lap. De Costa is on a quick lap, so we'll keep you across them here we go De Vries then through turn 15 it's starting to feel like oh it's going a little bit there little lift I think this is my favorite turn in Formula E yeah it's a lot of fun <laughs> less fun for the tires <laughs> again neat and tidy for De Vries and that puts him 200s clear of Jake Dennis this is Jean-Eric Verne Diaz the cheetah driver comes through De Costa's a quarter of a second up in sector one and uh, Verne has gone to the top of the times at 23.299, but Tocosta is three tenths quicker than his teammate after the first sector. Uh, Evans, what happened to Evans? He was on a lap, wasn't he? Has he finished it? Sixth quickest? No, he's just done a good first sector. Here comes Tocosta. This is Oliver Rowland, followed by Tocosta into turn 11. Oop. Little lock up, but doesn't uh, hit the Rowland wall. And after the middle sector, De Costa is still up on Vern by a tenth and a half. Evans's middle sector is two tenths away, so still going to be in the mix of sort of everyone else, uh, Mitch Evans. But Tachita looking very, very strong. See how De Costa deals with the final corner. Yellow flag at uh, turn eight. So someone's had a moment there, but De Costa goes quickest. And Suchita's with a big chunk of time, actually, over the rest of the pack. So close with De Vries, Dennis Van Dorn, Nato, Evans. But to Costa and Verne, four tenths clear. And anyone on a full power lap now is getting affected by that yellow flag. Oh, and straight on has gone De Costa. So De Costa set his flying lap and then gone straight on at the first corner. Sam Bird on full power. Yellow flag goes away. Its track is now clear at turn eight. Bird hitting that bump through 15 right up to the wall. And it's ninth for Sam Bird. But again, I think he would have lost time with the uh, with the various yellow flags that were out there. Robin Freitz has done the fastest first sector of anyone. He's four tenths away in the middle sector and goes seventh quickest. And then this is Eduardo Mortara who goes third. Good lap for Mortara in the in the Venturi there. Going third quickest. A whole host of cars coming across the line now. Uh, Ericsson remains 23rd. I think uh, Blomqvist is starting the lap as they come down in towards turn one. No, he's backed off, so check and flag out. Roland is still got to set a lap time. He's up, Oliver Roland. The Nissan coming through the banking at turn 15, nicely pointed down the hill. 
and Roland nicks it at the line. A 1 minute 22.861, a quarter of a second quicker than the DS to Cheetahs, six tenths quicker than fourth place. Big, big field spread in those top four positions. Lynn's still got to finish a lap, so has Sete Camera, but they're not right up there. So Roland is going to set the fastest time of free practice two as the checkered flag falls. Lynn goes fourth in the end, so a very good final sector. First two sectors, he was six tenths away from Roland and then kept that gap through, uh, throughout the last sector. This is going to be really interesting because Oliver Roland is in group two, you know, unlike Da Costa, who's going to be in group one. So that's obviously going to play to Oliver Roland's advantage. Um, and with that pace, we could see a pole position from him. Here comes Buemi uh, to complete his lap and take the chequered flag. But yeah, Roland quick and De Costa and Vern right in there. Sims is still on a 250, I think, but uh, doesn't improve. De Vries sixth, Van Dorn ninth, Freitz. Uh, can't see him. Tenth. Tenth, yep, yeah, right <laughs> behind Van Dorn. Evans eighth. So the, the, the contenders aren't quite right there on the pace, are they, after that? So, so much for saying how competitive it is. Yeah. <laughs> The unpredictability of Formula E continues. And this is the thing that... In its it... next chapter in Puebla. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Uh, absolutely. So, Roland quickest, Acosta second, Byrne third, Lynn fourth, Okara fifth. Now they're doing their practice starts. Love that the cloud just sits over those hills just behind. And uh, when the cloud clears, you can see the volcano. Was it smoking this morning? <laughs> I couldn't see it. 5 a.m. where the Popica Catapel. Oh my goodness! I oh, commit. So close. <laughs> what is it? Popica Tepetal was smoking or not? It's the fifth highest peak uh, in North America, which is quite remarkable. But because it's it's about five and a half thousand feet. Uh, sorry, five and a half thousand meters. But Mexico City is at two and a half thousand meters. So it itself is only 3,000 meters, so therefore it's not actually that tall, but because we're already high, it, it's really high. So actually, if you wanted to climb a mountain, that's a good bet because the base is already quite high. <laughs> Precisely, because 3,000 meters is not, okay, it's, it's, it's high, but it's not crazy high to, to, to climb. Have you climbed a mountain? I have climbed, I've climbed Mount Fuji, which is, I think, four and a half thousand meters, oh. 4,200. Great. And I've also, although we drove up halfway, I will admit, and uh, I've also climbed uh, Mount Rinjani in Indonesia, which was so 4,200 meters. I'm going to claim Kilimanjaro. Have you done Kilimanjaro? Yeah, 5,600. <laughs> Did you drive up halfway? Uh, no. <laughs> the full, wow. Six days. Good stuff. Anyway, back um, to the racing. I climbed Mount Fuji with Tom Clarkson of Did you? Formula One fame. He got us lost on the way down. <laughs> Absolute nightmare. A storm came in. Phones weren't working. It's terrifying. I think it was the scariest couple of hours of my life. Anyway, Nick DeBries, second place man in the championship, finishes sixth in that session. Talking to Albert Lau, the uh, race engineer, his race engineer. But again, a really, really interesting session, but quite a big field spread up at the front. Oliver Rowland quickest, the one minute 22.861, a quarter of a second clear of uh, Antonio Felix da Costa. And then jean eric Verne third, Lynn fourth. So six tenths from first to fourth. But then what? A tenth and a half from Lynn to Van Dorn in ninth. So uh, very, very tight. Degrassi 13th, Cassidy made some mistakes. Sam Bird didn't get a, didn't get a clean lap in. And uh, also Andre Lotter not getting a good lap in. Sims only got four laps in the end, actually. So. I wonder if he came back into the pits and things weren't quite right for Sims, because I thought he went out a little earlier than that, but we'll have to uh, wait and see. Well, make sure you join us for qualifying. Gets underway at noon, so in one hour and ten minutes' time, qualifying for round eight of the Formula E World Championship will be getting underway. Who are we going, then, for, for pole position, Shields? Well, I called it already. Are you not listening? 
barely. I said Oliver Rowland. <laughs> no, I think you said like he could okay, get. Okay, you were I like, did. I he did. He could I get a pole position. Right, and if and if you're if you're if you choosing who's getting pole position is just saying the quickest driver, then that's a bit boring. Fair point. Okay. All right. I will come up with a slightly more original answer. Although I think it's actually quite plausible. Um, you know, the fact I, I do think the fact that he is in Group Two is going to play to his advantage. Are we going to see someone from Group One taking pole position? It's unlikely. And then look at the difference in pace between Oliver and then De Costa and Vern. So surely that's the most sensible answer. I'm a big, I'm a big Roland qualifying fan. Uh, he took uh, a load of pole positions in season five in his first season in the championship. He was looking good in Rome earlier this year until he hit the wall on the exit. Nick De Vries going back to his dirt racing days in New Zealand earlier on. And there's Alex Lynn. Alex Lynn up in fourth position, but it's that classic, you can't rule anyone out. True. I mean, you know, De Costa, as we said, he is riding the wave at the moment. It could be another pole position back to back since Monaco. I, uh, yeah, De Costa is in such good form. He, well, he's, he's taken two of the last three pole positions, but it's, can you get near Super Pole for, uh, if you're in Group 1? That's going to be the question. And who can get the highest up the order in Group 1. We'll soon we'll find out the answer. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. We certainly will. Uh, there's Mitch Evans making his way back after uh, his run. But don't forget, you can get involved as well. FIAformulary.com slash fan boost to vote for your uh, favourite driver. Well, I guess it doesn't even have to be your favourite driver, but the driver you most want to boost and uh, give them that extra power boost in the second half of the race. De Costa and Van Dorn up at the top, Bird, De Vries and Evans, the top five at the moment. Jean-Eric Vern just outside, so is Degrassi. Robin Fryns would like your, your uh, fan boost vote, by the way. <laughs> Are we allowed to say that? He's, he blames I've... the fact that De Costa had fan boost in Monaco. That took the race win away from him. Really? Yeah, so well, it really important. does that's play into the results. Exactly. Have you ever voted on fan boost? Are we I, allowed to? I, I have not. No, I don't I think feel I like we should. OK, <laughs> well, let's not. Second free practice for the Puebla E Prix got underway in much sunnier conditions than the first free practice session and all the cars straight out onto the track. A big lockup down at uh, turn one. We saw lockups galore actually. Andre Lothera there going straight on at turn 11 and uh, oh, almost distracting Eduardo Mortara into a moment. Mitch Evans kicking up a bit of dirt. <laughs> Your favorite moment in Formula E. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, then we had Lucas Degrassi right up behind and then this was Nick Cassidy, big slide. Coming through turn seven, a very tricky corner. That caught out less people in the second practice session in the dry, it has to be said. Oliver Rowland had a big lock up and then a hit of the wall. Went back to the pits, everything looked fine. And he went back out to do his full power run. Stoffel van Dorn wrestling with the car through turn 15. And that was Bird kicking up a bit of dirt on the exit of seven. That was uh, De Costa who did his full power lap, finished his lap, and then went straight on. Checker flag fell, a flurry of cars across the line, but Roland, despite hitting the wall earlier on in the session, managed to go quickest, a 1 minute 22.861. Sebastian Buemi, the other Nissan Edams driver, making his way back, but Oliver Roland, quickest in free practice one, quickest in free practice two, in group two for qualifying later on. The man from Barnsley's got a good opportunity, but we are approaching the halfway point of the season and points and championship positions are going to get more and more crucial as we continue. There's Robin Freitz. He is the championship leader. What can he do in qualifying in an hour's time? Join us then. You'll find out.